Uh, we are now covering lesson 13 of the cross series, and the title of this lesson is called The Unpardonable Sin. And under our first point, the term unpardonable uh, is not in the Bible. Uh, the concept is there. Uh, for example, uh, there's a verse that says, never, hath never forgiveness, as out of Hebrews, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. That's also taken from Hebrews. Now, under point two, what did Jesus say was the unpardonable sin? So we have this recorded in Matthew 12, 22 through 32. Matthew 12:22. And there were those who brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and dumb, and he healed him, so that the man spoke and saw. Remarkable. Totally blind, and he can't talk. And Jesus touches him, his eyes, 20-20 vision, he can see and he can speak the language. And all the multitudes were amazed and began to say, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? So they were, you know, this has to be the Messiah. <laughs> but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this man cast out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And it was an issue of, of demon possession, because 22 says, then they brought to him a demon-possessed man who was blind and dumb. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this man cast out demon only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And knowing their thoughts, he said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house Divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Consequently, they shall be, they shall be your judges." But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come among you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man, strong man and then he will plunder his house? <clears throat> he who is not with me is against me. He who does not scatter he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I say to you, and I believe he's addressing the Pharisees, therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. And whatever you speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever shall speak against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this age nor in the age to come. And so it speaks of uh, something that cannot be forgiven, this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And so what is that sin? It's basically attributing uh, the work of God to the devil. That's what they were doing. They said, you know, you cured that man. You, you, uh, you know, caused him to see. You caused him to speak uh, through the power of the devil. <clears throat> and this is what Jesus was coming against. And so this, um, this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is attributing the, the work of God. 
and say, no, it was the devil, you know, you healed him by the power of the devil. And Jesus <laughs> said, no, that's not true. You know, every other blasphemy, every, everything else can be forgiven, but this, this goes beyond the pale. It's, it's very, very serious. Mark 3, 28 through 30. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men and whatever <laughs> blasphemies they utter. And of course we know that there's so many before they come to Christ use the name mm -hmm. of the Lord Jesus in vain. Mm -hmm. uh, they damn mm -hmm. the Father and you know all, all kinds of blasphemies like that. But people like that can be saved. And that's what he's saying. Truly I say to you that all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whosoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. So there's your unforgivable sin. Uh, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. So he is replying again to those who were attributing that wonderful healing to the devil. You know, that was the devil in you that was working that. Then we have Luke 12, 10. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemes against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. So we have our three witnesses. That, so our, our question comes next. Uh, what is blasphemy? And the answer is it's to speak irreverently, to defame, to slander, to harm reputation, uh, to blame unjustly, to discredit, to injure reputation by false statements, false charges, misrepresentations. <clears throat> they were definitely misrepresenting God when they said the devil was the source of that power. Uh, point four, can a man who's never known Christ commit the unpardonable sin? And um, I, I would have to answer yes to that question uh, because the one who had blasphemed the Holy Spirit in the text uh, were the Pharisees uh, that were obviously not walking with God at the time. Um, it could also perhaps be committed by those that had repented at one time or another as well. Apostasy is, <coughs> is possible. We see that uh, in the New Testament. Our outlines make a statement uh, rejecting Christ too many times and now cannot be saved. He said there's not one scripture to support. And I would, I would uh, have to respectfully disagree with that statement because I believe there are scriptures that, that say that a person can harden their heart uh, to the point uh, where the Spirit of God leaves them to their own devices. And they can sin away the day of grace. And I would like to point out just a couple of verses that, that we have here. Romans one twenty eight. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer referring to the un ungodly that 
reject him. Uh, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, the haters of God, just a, a terrible list of, of things. The, from this verse, it shows us that, that sinners can come to a state where God just turns them over uh, to a reprobate mind. That if that's how you insist upon living, you know, you have a free, you're a free moral agent. Mm -hmm. and, and he releases them uh, to their own devices. And there comes the hardening of heart, you know, where it becomes impossible for them to, to uh, come back again. You're going to say something, Doris? Last question. Uh, in the time of Noah, you know, they, there was a preaching, but they they refused and refused and refused, and finally the door shut, and they were left to their own eternal cho choice. That's correct. Another verse I'd like us to look at: Second Thessalonians two eight through twelve. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore, also, we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think that was the verse I was looking for. Yeah. Second Thessalonians 2, 8 through 12. <laughs> that was eight one, eight chapter two. one. Okay, it's a wonderful scripture. <laughs> it was. It and it's true, 100% <laughs> true. Well, let's look at Second Thessalonians 2, 8 through 12. Mm -hmm. I can make atonement for you. Yeah, <laughs> could you make an atonement? And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Oh, that is so pretty clear. So that's, that's a very, very clear. It is a very frightening verse that God <laughs> sends on them a strong delusion uh, that they would believe a lie and and so people in that in that position where God has gave them over to a strong delusion uh, they're not going to be saved you know they've they've crossed the point um, you know and only God knows where that is but it says God does it you know, they, they're self-deluded for sure but there comes a point where, you know, God turns them over to that reprobate mind, sends on them this strong delusion, you know, and the strong delusion comes from the enemy. He's the deluder, but God allows, you know, the enemy to, to, to delude that person. And, you know, there comes a point where they've sun, sinned away their day of grace. That's how the old fathers, you know, two, three hundred years ago, used that terminology, sending away your day of grace. Mm -hmm. 
terrible to think about. Mm. That, that verse in Thessalonians uh, declares that, that it's possible that it can happen. We're going to go on in um, 5.1 under Numbers 15, 27 through 36. And we'll be going through verses that speak of apostasy and, and men turning away from God, even those who had a relationship, but then went back. Numbers fifteen twenty seven. And if any soul sin through ignorance, then he shall bring a she goat of the first year for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for the soul that sinneth ignorantly when he sitteth by or sinneth by ignorance before the Lord to make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. You shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. But the soul that doeth aught presumptu presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord. And that soul shall be cut off from among his people, because he hath despised the word of the Lord and hath broken his commandment. That soul shall utterly be cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward, or in prison, because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, This man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died. And the Lord commanded, as the Lord commanded Moses. So this is a very sobering passage of Scripture, but it starts in verse twenty-seven. If anyone sins, my my version says unintentionally, and what does the King James say? Ignorant. Ignorantly. You know, so so. It makes a distinction be, between, you know, someone that, you know, really didn't intend to or was ignorant of the matter, and then it distinguishes between that person. That person can make an atonement. You know, if he's done it ignorantly, they'll, they'll take a goat. You know, he shall make an atonement. But verse 30, but the person who does anything defiantly or presumptuously, uh, they're cut off. And then as the case test, uh, the man gathering wood on the Sabbath, you know, by this time that the Ten Commandments were given, they knew the Law of Moses, they knew the Ten Commandments, and he's presumptuously you know, knowingly, willingly out there gathering wood on the Sabbath, which was prohibited, and God brings a sentence, you know, to kind of, to, to demonstrate, you know, his teaching. You know, there's the presumptuous, there's the sins done in ignorance or um, unintentionally, this, mm -hmm. this version says. Uh, we have Deuteronomy 17, 23, I'm sorry, 12 through 13. Deuteronomy 17. And the man that will do presumptuously and will not hearken unto the priest that standeth to minister there before the Lord thy God, or unto the judge, even that man shall die, and thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. 
and all the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. Again, another extremely serious warnings that these presumptuous sins were not forgiven. Let's now come to the New Testament because we're going to see that what God established in the Old is really carried over in the New Testament as well in Hebrews 6, 6, I'm sorry, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. That's very, very serious, isn't it? Yeah, and it's obviously is talking about one who at one time had, had repented and, and believed the gospel because they've been enlightened, they've tasted of the heavenly gift of salvation, have been partakers of the Holy Spirit, so they've been saved, baptized with the Holy Spirit, they've tasted of the good word of God, the powers of the age to come. <clears throat> You know, they, they've, they've experienced the gifts of the Holy Spirit in their life and then have fallen away, which is a passive, just turning your back, walking away. He is a very strong word in verse 6. It is impossible okay. to renew them again to repentance. And so again, that there comes a place where it's unpardonable in the sight of Almighty God. You know, when they, when they just, you've known, you've totally walked away from it. And, and God says, a very strong word, it is impossible. Word. To renew them again to repentance. Since they again crucified it themselves, the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. Uh, Hebrews 10, 26 through 29 is... Almost like an echo of that, but it's a strong second witness. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for it of judgment and fiery indignation that which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witness. Of how much more sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite to the Spirit of grace. Again, an extremely strong passage. <clears throat> Sometimes we look back at the Old Testament and we read the Old Testament where... Uh, the sins that were done presumptuously, knowingly and willingly, uh, there was no atonement. They were to be taken out and stoned. So we look at that and say, wow, <laughs> glad I didn't live in Old Testament times. <laughs> but then we come to the New Testament and he says, if you think that was bad, how much sore punishment do you think they'll receive who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and is regarded as unclean, the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, past tense? He was, and he has insulted the spirit of grace. So he contrasts the old and the new. <laughs> so he thought it was back, back there. How much severer? Now here in the New Testament, because you're sinning against more truth than they had back then. Mm. And so, yes, this is, we're looking at unpardonable sins here mm -hmm. of, of, of apostasy and, and just <coughs> renouncing uh, once we, what was once held dear. 
2 Peter 2, 20 and 21. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than, after they had known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Again, an extremely strong a statement, and there's no question who it's written to. They've escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, how can you say they're not saved? Because the opponent, or the proponents of one saved always say, will say, well, they were never saved in the first place. Because you can't lose your salvation. But it talks about they've escaped the defilements of the wor world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it's it, through the experiential knowledge. They've come to the cross. They've escaped, you know, their sin. Jesus is their Savior. But then they go right back again into it are entangled in them and overcome. So it's not just a brief, you know, tripping up now and then. You know, it's entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become for them the worst and the first. So yes, there are, there is such a thing as the unpardonable sin. First uh, Timothy 1, 12 and 13. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Okay, it was ignorance and unbelief, it was not presumptuous, and he was a blasphemer of of Christ. But he was forgiven. You know, he found grace. And and that's why he was so humbled that, you know, he he understood that he deserved eternal punishment. But he thank was so thankful for the forgiveness. Of first John no while we're in Timothy, we have another Timothy passage. First Timothy one, eighteen through twenty. This command I entrust you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that you may fight the good fight, keeping faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among them are Hymenius and Alexander, two former brethren, that had walked with Paul, and he said they've sh suffered shipwreck of their faith. And he goes on to say, I've delivered them over to Satan, so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. Mm -hmm. and, and so their very backsliding is, is blasphemy against the work of, of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, a strong warning here of a New Testament apostle who who declares to us, here's two men that were once part of the church that are now outside. You know, he said, I've delivered them over to Satan. First John 5, 16, and I'll do 16 through 18. If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not not unto death there is a sin unto death i do not say that he shall pray for it all righteous unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not unto death we know that whosoever is born of god sinneth not 
But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one touches him not. It says, all unrighteousness is sin, verse 17, and there is a sin not leading to death. You know what kind of sin that would be? A sin not leading to death. It's the sin that's been repented of. The sin that's been repented of. That's why it says in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness is sin. There's a sin not leading to death. That's the one that you realize, you come to him, you repent of it, and he forgives you. And there is a sin leading to death. That's a sin that a person does not repent of. Because the wages of sin is death. And then 2 Timothy 2, 16 through 19. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like angering. Among them are Hilaris and Thylus. Okay. Who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. Some, but God's firm foundation stands bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and Amen. that everyone whose name names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Amen. 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 Depart from wickedness. Amen. And so he names again two former brethren uh, that, that have gone away. They have gone away from the truth. If you missed one, John 9, 35 to 41. Okay, let's I have that one. Yes. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into the world, that they might that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin, but now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, we have one, one more page on 41, just a couple of, of brief statements here. He says, there are two ways for those who have been saved to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Uh, the first way is to be apostasy, where... Again, a person had once been in the kingdom of God, and then they totally turn their back and 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 walk away uh, from God. And there's no forgiveness for that. And also discrediting the work of the Holy Spirit, knowing when it's God, or attributing the work of God to the devil. Now that was what we saw in our original passages, where the Pharisees uh, claim that Jesus was you know, doing his work of restoring the sight and driving out the demon that was causing him to be mute and saying, well, you did that through the power of Beelzebub, the devil. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, that is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. He said, that's a non-forgivable thing. Uh, something that is done ignorantly speaking 
against the work of the Holy Spirit, of course, there's forgiveness for that. As soon as, as, soon as uh, we are convicted that we've done wrong, we should immediately confess. Uh, under point eight, he says there's two ways for Christians and sinners to blaspheme the Father, Jesus, and the Word. Uh, through misrepresentation, uh, claiming to be God, uh, when it is not, uh, you know, it, it would be possible to be forgiven. We have an example of Revelation 2, 9, where Jesus speaks to the church. He's speaking to believers. Uh, they've spoken something that is not correct, and he tells them to repent. Revelation 2, 9. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. And he goes on to say, uh, to tell that church to repent. Yeah. Uh, the same Revelation 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church at Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this. I know your deeds, you have a name that you are alive, and you are dead. But then he goes on and says, uh, remember therefore, verse 3, remember therefore from what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. If therefore you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will know not hour that I will come upon you. And so again, the, those that were in sin, the remedy is repent. Mm -hmm. And they, they would be forgiven if they repented. Mm -hmm. Mark 14, 61 to 64. But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and said, What need we any further witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. Was there repentance for that man? To me, he committed the unpardonable sin as well. You know, it's not recorded as such. But... Um, it was in his power to do good. Yeah. Mm. But but he defamed, he blasphemed God. Under, the, under this heading, he said that it's possible to be forgiven, but I have serious doubts if that high priest Caiaph Caiaphas ever acknowledged, you know, that he had... Um, been the murderer of the Son of God mm -hmm. or recognize him as the Son of God. Uh, point B, mm -hmm. uh, to think or speak evil of the Father, Son, or the Word, um, there, there could be forgiveness according to some passages here, 2 Samuel 12, verse 14. Albeit because of this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So it was David. Yes, so that was David, but David did repent in this case mm -hmm. when Nathan said, Thou art the man, mm -hmm. you know, and he, he did repent of that particular sin and God did forgive him. Uh, Matthew eleven eighteen and 19. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of his children. Amen. And so they, those opposers could have been forgiven. Uh, Titus 2, 3 through 5. Be 
the aged women likewise, that they be in the, is that right? Titus? Three. Yeah, that's what Two, we have, Titus. Three, three to five. Two, three the to aged five. women, that be me. <laughs> likewise, that they be in behavior as becoming holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Yeah. And that's probably why he used that word, because the word blaspheme. So in conclusion to this lesson, I believe it's obvious in the Bible there is such a thing as an unpardonable sin, and uh, we certainly do not want to commit it. And there is what was referred to as the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and that was to attribute the work of God to the devil. And that was very serious in the eyes of Almighty God. So hallelujah. So the unpardonable sin, the bottom line, the unpardonable sin is any sin that is not repented of. Any sin that is not repented of is, is unpardonable. It's pardonable when we confess it, forsake it, repent of it. Then he'll for, freely forgive us by his grace. But if we refuse, then God can't pardon it. And the grace that is given from God, the grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. So the grace of God will be working in our heart. The grace will bring conviction. The grace will not give us any rest or peace until we get on our knees and, and say, Lord, I missed it. I was wrong. So, Father, I thank you for this lesson, Lord. We thank you that you are a forgiving God. And, Father, as we look back over our own history, Father, we can say truly, you are a forgiving God. But, Father, we realize that there are those that, that come to a place where they can turn their back upon you, as unconceivable as it may be in our minds at this time. Father, we have a record in history, in your Bible, that it has actually happened. And so, Father, I just pray, O oh God, I just pray, Lord, that we would have tender hearts before you, that we would not be as those who shrink back, as the epistle to the Hebrews puts it, but we would be those that would press on in the things of God. And Father, I thank you that there is forgiveness, no matter how uh, terrible the crime against an almighty God. Lord, you're so gracious. You're so merciful. And so, Father, we just thank you for your holy word. And now as we go our separate ways, we pray that your blessing would be upon this word. You, you would seal it to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.